You guys have been so well behaved that I wanted to reward you today and I bought you a Junior's Cheesecake. It's the best cake in the entire world. I guess more for me. All right, today we're gonna to learn about empires in Central America. So, we're gonna learn about three primarily, and that is the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas. This lecture will start with a little bit about the Olmecs. I don't believe that's in your book, but they're cool, so we'll throw that in there. And then uh, we'll get on to the Mayans. It's not underlined because it's hard to have a test question about it, but you should know about corn. It turns out corn is in a lot of stuff. Oh, city-states are back, but are they? Perhaps. We'll talk about Tenochtitlan. We'll briefly mention human sacrifice and conquistadors. You need to know about the Colombian Exchange. You need to know about it so much that it's now red. Uh-oh, Colombian Exchange. Dude. 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 Oh man, that's a big arrow. You really must need to know about Colombian Exchange. Uh, the Colombian Exchange is in a lot of books, and we will talk about why it's so important. Coming up soon on World History. All right, what is a city-state? You should know. You tell me. That's right. It's like a city and a state put together an autonomous, anonym, autonomous political unit. Awesome. Uh, what's the big deal about corn? So much stuff is made with corn. You, I don't think you understand how much is made with corn. We'll talk about it. And then what was Tenochtitlan? It's a large city. It's the Aztec capital, and that's where present-day Mexico City is. Spoiler alert or trick question alert. If I ask you where Mexico City is or I ask you where Tenochtitlan is, they're in the same place. All right, let's look at our geography. You got an old river. It's the Amazon. I don't want to give it away, but what will the Amazon, how will the Amazon be different than the Tigris, than the Euphrates, than the Yellow, than the Indus? Think about it as we go along through here. Countries, you should know Mexico. You should know Mexico City. Mexico City is not a country. I should fix that slide and make it places. But for now, it's Mexico and Mexico City. Also, the Yucatan Peninsula. It's a location and the Andes Mountains. Fair enough? Let's learn them. Remember your continents? Excellent. Here is Mexico. It is the country south of the United States. Notice the star. That is where Mexico City is. That is where Tenochtitlan used to be. We will talk about that city in more depth coming up soon. The Yucatan Peninsula, it's just a little tale. You guys always come up with, uh, you know, everything looks like an animal. The Mediterranean Sea looks like a seahorse. I don't know. It's the tail. It's the claw. You guys tell me. I wish you were here. I need your imagination. I look at it and I say, uh, it looks like a peninsula. But I'm sure you could come up with something creative. Put it in the notes. All right. Where are the Andes Mountains? Here they are. Andes also is a candy, which is delicious. It's part mint and part chocolate. Okay, we feel good about knowing that. What kind of map is over here on the left? It's got all the, I don't know how to describe it. It looks like it's 3D topographical map. Exactly, good job. Amazon River, boom, there it is. Cuts right through the top of Brazil there. Feel good about that? Excellent. Do you remember what was the theory on how people first came to the Americas? You know this. Take a second. That is right. Land bridge theory is correct. Good job. And what was the last continent that people occupied? 
South America. Perfect. So let's just refresh your memory. There's a couple of theories on how people got here. The number one theory is that there was some type of bridge, land bridge, ice bridge, and people just walked across. The other bridge, the other theory, excuse me, involves boats going along the coast. Here's a vocab word. If we talk about pre-Columbian, that just means before Columbus or before European um, contact. So, last time on world history, people fan out across the globe. The ice bridge melts. People stop coming to North and South America. If you're over here, you're kind of stuck here. You're going to develop in your own isolated environment with different plants and different animals and different ways of doing things than the rest of the world. Then Columbus discovers America and all of that gets reintroduced, connected, intertwined. And so that's what we're talking about. People that developed in isolation for thousands of years and then boom, they're discovered and the whole world is put together. Does that make sense? Okay, we're on our way to there. If you, know, if you didn't follow along, don't worry, we'll cover it again in a minute. Here are the Olmecs. I don't know why they're not in your book, but that is the oldest known culture in Mesoamerica. When I refer to Mesoamerica, that's just like saying Central America area. Okay, when I see that head, do you know what it makes me think of? The Sentinel from X-Men, right? Doesn't it kind of look like that? Look. Dude, I'm just saying. I'm not saying they copied it, but looks kind of looks kind of similar to me. Anyhow, here's a video about Olmec heads. The Temple Mayor, the main Aztec temple in what is now Mexico City. Looking at a small green stone sculpture of a human face. And although this was found buried as a kind of offering in the temple precinct, what we're looking at is something from a far older culture, older even than the Aztecs. This mask actually belonged to the Olmec culture, which started thriving somewhere between 1500 and 1200 BCE. So more than 1500 years before the Aztecs, the Olmecs were thriving along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, not even central Mexico, where the Aztecs are later building their capital city. So this is distant both in terms of geography, but it's also really distant in terms of time. For the Aztecs, looking back to the Olmecs, is something akin to us, in the modern era, looking back to the ancient Romans. This time for the Aztecs, looking back to the Olmecs, is something akin to us in the modern era, looking back to the ancient Romans. This mask is not much bigger than the palm of my hand. It's a traditional Olmec mask, and it's made in this beautiful green stone. It's polished. It's a great example of Olmec features like upturned lips, this almost baby face, almond eyes, the cleft in the head. And what's remarkable is that the Aztecs were actually collecting these objects and then ritually burying them at certain points. And this object would have been one of many buried in a specific offering. It shows us that the Aztecs had a reverence for the ancient cultures that came before them, that they were thinking historically. And that's true not only that they were looking to the Olmec, the kind of mother culture of Mesoamerica, but they were also looking to say the city of Teotihuacan and its inhabitants that was flourishing hundreds and hundreds of years before the Aztec. That's the city famous because according materials from what is now the southwest of the United States, they were bringing objects up from the Yucatan. The divisions that we think of in the modern world did not exist in the same way. It's a great example not only of their archaizing or their looking to the past, but also these vast trade networks throughout Mesoamerica. All right, welcome back. So let's take a look at our three civilizations on the map. In red, you have Aztec. What country are they in? Mexico, exactly. The Mayan are in that maroon, uh, well, that's not maroon. Let's call that hot pink. Uh, the Mayans are in the hot pink zone. That little area, you can call it a tail, a claw. What are you guys going to call it? What is that called? The Yucatan Peninsula, perfect. And then notice the Incas. We won't get to them in this lecture, but they're down there in South America. Uh, what mountains are right there? The Andes Mountains. Good job. Good job. All right, there's your Yucatan Peninsula. You can see some of the places where the Mayans, some of the Mayan uh, cities. Here it is on the map. Take a second and 
do your geography on the map. What kind of things did you, we just learn about? Can you place them on this world map? Go ahead, take a few seconds and fill out this map. Okay, excellent. Okay, in order to be considered a civilization, one of the things you need to have is monumental architecture. And so we can see um, these pyramid-like structures. Okay, let's take a look at the geography of this landscape. You're gonna look, you see a lot of forest, a lot of rainforest and jungle. Here's another picture. Okay, so how will this geography affect the civilization? How are the Mayans gonna develop? Are they gonna develop giant cities in this? Or are they gonna develop the city-states? Check this out. They're going to develop as city-states according to your book, according to what we've known for the last couple of decades. But new research has come out in the last year and a half, two years, that challenges that, and it challenges that pre that notion. And so we're going to take a look, and you can tell me: Do they de develop a city state? Did the environment change? What happened? We're not exactly sure. I'm going to give you the evidence. You tell me what happened. Okay? Awesome. Who else developed as a city state in our history? Think about it. From history class, who is our number one? If we think city state, we say. Wait. Greece, that's correct. Good job. All right. Well done. Now, let's talk about corn. Yes, that's right. The original corn is on the left. It looks like a little piece of grass, but through uh, selective breeding and other uh, advancements in science, uh, we have been able to engineer corn to be almost something totally different than what the ancients would have thought of as corn. Here's another picture of how corn has changed over time. Now we're gonna watch videos about corn. Don't skip these videos, you've got to watch. 10,000 years ago, there was no corn, just a grass called Teosinti, specifically ZMA's species Paravaglumus. This grass looked little like modern corn. The plant is highly branched, the kernels are small, Few in number, not fused, and enclosed in a hard fruit case. But somehow, early farmers turned this grass into corn. So how did they do it? When early farmers grew their proto-corn, each year they selected what they considered the best individuals to take seeds from for the next season. With each generation, the plant was enriched for traits that made it more useful to humans. Over time, random genetic mutations that would improve the crop would occur, and these would be bred into corn by this process. And slowly, the plant became closer to the corn we know today. But that's not the whole story. Up to 12% of the genetic material in corn is derived from ZMA's species Mexicana, and these genes are thought to have been introduced through introgressive hybridization. By this process, genes are introduced into one plant from a closely related plant. It begins with the two lines being crossed, producing offspring, where one allele of each gene comes from each parent. Then, by repeatedly backcrossing with one of the parents, we can be left with only a few genes derived from the second parent, effectively introducing these genes into one plant from the other. How intentionally this was done by our ancient Mesoamerican farmers we will likely never know, but we do know that the end result was a humble grass became the power crop we know today. But how easy was it to change a wild grass into something similar to today's corn? Well, in the 1930s, Nobel Prize winning scientist George Beadle did an experiment. He crossed the wild grass with a domesticated corn, producing an F1 hybrid containing one copy of each gene from each parent, one from the wild grass and the other from modern corn. He then crossed the F1 hybrid with itself, producing an F2 hybrid, and scored the phenotype of these plants. He was looking for how many of these plants resembled modern corn and wild type grass, and how many were somewhere in between. If you remember your high school biology and your Punnett squares, you'll know what to expect. For each gene, one quarter of the plants would carry two copies of the allele from corn, and another quarter two copies originally from the wild grass, with the other half of the plants retaining one copy from each. So if one gene was governing the entire phenotypic difference between modern corn 
and wild theosynthy, we would find one in four plants that look like corn. If corn has conquered the world in a lot of ways. I mean, it is a remarkable plant. A hundred years ago, a farmer in America could grow maybe 20 bushels of corn on an acre. Today, 200 bushels is no problem. That's an astonishing achievement, for which breeders deserve credit, for which fertilizer makers deserve credit, for which pesticide makers all deserve credit. In the United States today, 30% of our land base is, is being planted to corn. That, that's largely driven by government policy, government policy that, in effect, allows us to produce corn below the cost of production. The truth of the matter is, is we're paid to overproduce, and it was caused by these large multinational interests. The reason our government's promoting corn is the Cargills, the ADMs, Tyson, Smithfield, they have an interest in purchasing corn below cost of production. They use that interest and that extensive amount of money they have to, to lobby Congress to give us the kind of farm bills we now have. The farm bill, which should really be called a food bill, codifies the rules of the entire food economy. Farm policy is always focused on these commodity crops because you can store them. We encourage farmers to grow as much corn as they could grow, to get big, to consolidate. We subsidized farmers by the bushel. We produced a lot of corn, and they came up with uses for it. We are now engineering our foods. We know where to turn to for certain traits, like mouthfeel and then flavors, and we bring all of these pieces together and engineer new foods that don't stale in the refrigerator, don't develop rancidity. Of course, the biggest advance in recent years was high fructose corn syrup. You know, I would venture to guess, if you go and look on the supermarket shelf, I'll bet you 90% of them would contain either a corn or soybean ingredient. And most of the time, it'll contain both. Corn is a great raw material. You get that big, fat kernel of starch, and you can break that down and reassemble it, and you can make high fructose corn syrup, and you can make maltodextrin and diglycerides and xanthan gum and ascorbic acid. All the all those obscure ingredients on the processed food. It's remarkable how many of them can be made from corn. Plus, you can feed it to animals. Welcome back. By the way, this is a good opportunity for me to tell you that the word of the day is cheesecake. So make sure you select cheesecake as the word of the day so that you get credit for today. Make sure you check back here soon for the continuation of this lecture. Uh, have a good day.